Tathagata Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So people are welcome to keep meditating. Have your eyes open or your eyes closed. I'll share some reflections on Dhamma for about 25 minutes, something like that, and then open it up for questions. So uh, Tanis Bo and I are going through different sets of Dhammas each month. Uh, last month we went through the five aggregates and this month we're going through the six sense bases so that's the eye the ears the nose the tongue the body and the mind so the five senses which aristotle talked about and which what probably most people grew up just thinking of five senses and then the buddha added the mind as a sixth sense And one way of relating to these six senses uh, is in considering what the Buddha said that we should do, do with the senses and how to practice with the senses, how uh, working with the senses can be part of our whole day practice, uh, a, a life leading towards deeper and deeper peace really incorporates more and more of our life. And it's not just sitting on the cushion, but it's also when we talk to people and when we look at people and when we look at cameras and pillows and watches and things like that, um, how we listen to things and how we, what we touch. Um, and all of these senses are both active and, and passive in a sense. So the Buddha spoke about sense restraint uh, or indriya sangvara or guarding the sense doors. And that's a very real part of practice. It's a real part of living a, uh, a more and more examined life and really leading a life which leads to more and more peace because if we're just meditating and that's all we think of as being part of a Buddhist path or part of a spiritual path, then that's pretty limited. It's just however long you meditate each day, you know, 10 minutes, an hour, two hours, three hours, whatever. Um, we want to bring the rest of our lives into it. So probably one of the coolest metaphors and images uh, and parables that the Buddha uses in all of the Tipitaka, in my opinion, in the, the Buddhist canon, which is huge. You've got like, if it's on a bookshelf, it takes up a bookshelf that's maybe two feet wide with six shelves you know it takes up uh, all of those all of that space um, it's a lot the buddhist canon is really big so this is a really cool uh, metaphor so the buddha starts off by giving a metaphor for what it's like to not have your senses restrained so basically just to whatever you want to look at you look at and whatever you don't want to look at you just no yeah um Whatever you want to hear, you, you listen to, you love that. And then whatever is, you know, uh, painful to the ear, whatever you don't want to listen to, you're just burdened by that. And it brings up displeasure. Same with the other senses. You like the smells and you don't like the tastes and you just go with what you like and you really push away and resist what you don't like. So the simile that the Buddha gave for this is, suppose you were to take six animals yeah, let's put them in a auditorium. The Buddha didn't say where, but uh, we just need a big space for this experiment. Um, so you've got six animals. We've got a jackal and we've got a bird. Let's make it a big bird, uh, but not the big bird, <laughs> just a big bird. And we've got a dog and we've got a snake and we've got a monkey and we've got a crocodile. 
Yeah, so the Buddha's a genius. Yeah, I mean, this is hilarious already. Um, so what the Buddha says, suppose you were to take these six animals and then tie them together with a, a rope, a very strong rope. So you've got ropes you know, tied to the alligator's tail and to the monkey's tail and to the snake's tail and to the dog's tail and the bird's tail and to the jackal's tail, all of these. And then you tie them together with a knot in the middle. Yeah. Um, it's kind of hilarious to imagine. Um, and if it was a YouTube video, it might be funny for the first uh, minute or so. But then what happens? You've got all these animals tied together with a knot in the middle. Yeah. They're just going to be dragged by whichever animal is the strongest, which most of the time, unless it's a huge bird or a huge dog or whatever, is going to be in a baby alligator. Most of the time, it's going to be the alligator just pulls all of these other animals along. And so it is with a, a mind that's not restrained. Basically, uh, whatever sense it is, uh, the mind just goes out that sense door and runs after it. Um, and similarly, uh, the Buddha says that a mind that's trained is like taking these same six animals and tying them up to a firm pillar, yeah, what's called an inda kila in Pali, <clears throat> which is like the entrance column at a, a village or a town. And there's, uh, I think maybe in the, the commentaries, there's a, an image of what these inda kilas would look like. And suppose it's uh, four meters tall, made of completely of iron, four meters tall, one meter wide in diameter, uh, I'm sorry, four to eight meters tall with four meters above the ground and four meters below the ground, one meter wide, made completely of iron. I mean, that's, that's pretty serious. That's a pretty serious pole. So you take that pole and you put that in the middle and rather than tying all these animals, you still you know, tie the, the strong rope to each of their tails. Um, but rather than tying them to a knot in the middle, you tie them to this firm stake. And at the beginning, you know, the jackal is gonna run his way. The jackal is gonna run uh, to the charnel ground thinking, I'm just gonna go and chew on some bones. And the bird thinks I'm gonna fly away to my nest or fly away into the sky. Uh, the dog thinks I'm gonna go into the village. The snake thinks I'm gonna go into the ant hole. The monkey thinks I'm gonna go to the forest or to uh, a tree and the alligator thinks I'm going to go to the sea and they try to do that. Yeah. But they're tied to this huge pillar, this very strong, deeply rooted pillar. And eventually they're going to reach the end of the rope and they're going to pull on it for a while, but eventually they're going to realize, nope, there's no way, there's no way. And they're going to give up. And eventually they'll just relax and calm down and settle right there uh, and either sit down right there or lie down right there. And the Buddha said, that is how, uh, that's a mind that has these six senses restrained. And what for this simile is that iron pole, this indikila firmly rooted in the ground, the Buddha said it is mindfulness gone to the body, this kaya gata sati, uh, mindfulness imbued in the body, mindfulness uh, totally uh, enveloped into the body, totally embodied awareness. And at the end of the sutta, the Buddha does something which he does from time to time, which gives, which is actually give a, uh, an injunction or almost a, uh, an affirmation, like in quotes, the, the Pali equivalent of quotes, uh, bhikkhus or practitioners, you should train thus. We will be ones who, who develop and cultivate mindfulness gone to the body. We will make it our vehicle. We will make it our basis. We will establish it. We will firmly root it and we will bring it to completion, unquote. Thus practitioners, should you train yourselves. So it's a different, it's a um, more of a vocal type of meditation, but the Buddha did that. He was flexible. He didn't just have one uh, technique, but this affirmation is something which which we can practice to remember to come back and back to the to the body because it can be this uh, this pillar for us. Um, so the Buddha gave, in addition to suggesting that we uh, bring keep keep our body keep our awareness in the body uh, at all times, he actually gave specific techniques. Some of them you find just in the the rules for monks, uh, 
and others are specific techniques for relating to each of these senses. And so you can think of it as uh, training or taming uh, these different animals. So the Buddha didn't do this, but I feel like it's a neat way to think about these animals, to remember the animals uh, is as so. So you think of the eyes and the sight process as being like a jackal, yeah? So jackals, uh, basically, they don't really care what they eat. They're omnivorous. Uh, they'll eat basically the carcasses of uh, other animals. They'll run and eat, they'll eat garbage. They'll even eat um, diseased meat. They eat anything. Um, and so it is with our eyes. You know, if you don't have a, if you haven't been working with your eyes and figuring out how to look, how do I look? What do I look at? If you haven't been training in that, then yeah, you just sometimes most, a lot of people, kids, teenagers, adults who've never given much thought to this process or this is a training, you just go out and eat garbage with your eyes, basically. So that's why the eyes are like jackals in my thinking. Um, so we've got the ears are like birds. So basically just going off into the sky, we've got sound impulses coming in. The nose is like a dog. Uh, basically, dogs have senses of smell, which are something like 10 or 100,000 times stronger than the human sense of smell. Uh, and yeah, they've got big noses, so you can think of it like that. The snake is like the tongue. The tongue or our sense of taste. Uh, the body is like the monkey, because basically we've got monkey bodies, we've got ape bodies, and the mind is the strongest of them all. The mind is the crocodile, which usually wins unless it's a baby crocodile and you've got a big bird or a big dog. Um, so how do we train these? How do you train the jackal? Um, and I haven't done much research. I've never tried training jackals myself. Um, come up to me after and let me know if you have, but basically in terms of training the eye, uh, that is something which you have to do it when you, when you come to a monastery, when you come to a, a Buddhist practice, or when you start thinking about this, it's something that you want to do. You want to become skilled at how you're looking. There's a, a Thai phrase, which is uh, kit bin gobin, uh, sok bin gobin sok, which means uh, if, if you know how to do pleasure, then you'll be happy. Uh, so the second word there, basically know how. You can also have another phrase, do bin go bin so so if you know how to look if you're proficient at looking then you'll be happy and it'll, it's a path towards happiness um so yeah as monastics we've got rules around um what we what we look at and um where we go and for people who like rules i'll share some and if you're like okay don't want it monk uh, it's a bit too much i want to look at whatever i want to look at and don't want to hear what you got to say. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, for, for monastics, and I think this can be helpful for people in relationships as well. So monastics are not allowed to look lustfully at uh, people that they're sexually attracted to. And if they do, it's a, a certain type of offense. And um, yeah, it's a minor offense because the eyes are oftentimes, we're not always as mindful as we want to be, but um, yeah, that might be a practice you want to think of if you're in a relationship. Yeah, do I, do I want to let my eyes just go out and stare at the beautiful people that I, the eyes want to stare at? Um, monks also, we're not supposed to uh, watch movies. Um, and this is another thing which is good to become aware of. Uh, because what we look at has an impact on, on our hearts. And yeah, what type of movies are you watching? What type of TV are you watching? What type of YouTube content are you looking at? And is it leading to peace or is it leading to a disturbed heart and a disturbed mind? And with all of these six sense bases, uh, the Buddha said, the problem is not the thing, yeah? So the problem is not women for monks. It's not men for nuns or whatever one's sexual orientation is, it's not the movies, it's not any of the sense objects that are the problem, it's the desire and lust 
which goes into our jumping out through the eyeballs. <clears throat> so what we train and what the Buddha says, one aspect of uh, sense restraint is basically we don't pay attention to the signs and features of different forms, sounds, smells, tastes, touch, mental objects or thoughts, which would give rise to greed or aversion. Uh, so basically, if you've got to look at something which is bringing up lust um, or bringing up desire, if you've got, if you just love looking at cars, but you don't have the money to get them, then you might not want to look at them because it'll just give rise to, uh, to desire. Um, so yeah, just realizing what, how are the eyes burning? Yeah, if the eyes start burning with, uh, with greed or with liking or disliking or uh, too much passion or too much uh, aversion, then you might want to reel things in. And uh, a skillful practice for this is actually paying attention to the back. So when you're in a conversation or when you are watching whatever you're watching or looking at whoever or whatever you're looking at, if you notice that you're going out with greed, aversion, and delusion, bring your attention back to the felt sense at the back of the eyeball itself. Yeah, that's like you're literally, you know, reeling yourself in. I apologize. I'm not a fisher, so I don't know if this is the right hand motion. But um, yeah, you bring your, your mind back, you know, to the, to the retina. And that's a totally cool sensation. It's not uh, burning you know, with the fires of greed, anger, and delusion, as it says in the fire sermon. Um, yeah, so you can look at cooling things. If you're uh, in a city and you're noticing that it's just bringing up a lot of agitation, go out into nature, yeah, where you're not seeing as many angularity. You're not seeing so much angularity. Everything is in a right angle. Nothing is a right angle when you're out in the middle of a forest. And just that angularity, the sharpness of, of everything in a city, uh, <laughs> you know, it can have this uh, low grade piercing, you know, on, on the mind and you go out in nature and your eyes are just natural. There's, there's not the bright colors of a Marvel movie, which are just pulling you in. Uh, it's just earthy green and earthy brown and earthy red. And it, that's just so much more calming. And, and the eyeballs themselves actually feel more calm. So these are some ways of working with the, the eye, of training this, this eye faculty. And so that's both with the eyeball and actually looking at if, if it's, if it's uh, you're looking in a way which is giving ride to greed, then you can look at aspects of the thing. It's not totally the case that Brad Pitt all over his body for his whole life when he was six months old to when he passes away at however old he is, maybe 20, 120, whatever, when he passes away. It's not the case that Brad Pitt is 100%, 1,000% attractive in every way all the time. Yeah, And learning how to look at those aspects, which are unattractive. I mean, they're there. And yeah, I mean, maybe he's got back hair and no, uh, <laughs> no diss. I've got I've got some of that, um, but whatever it, whatever it, you know, whatever it takes and using your imagination. And this is uh, part of the Buddhist practice is, yeah, learning how to be creative with these things. You know, it's not the case that uh, like maybe back hair brings up lust for some people. Then looking at or imagining the things which will bring up dis, uh, which will bring up um, if if one's say. Uh, unattracted to something. So you see something ugly or aversive. Practice seeing if you can have the, the flexibility of mind, the flexibility of, of brain, the plasticity of brain power to actually, uh, yeah, find something that's not totally um, ugly about this thing or this person. Uh, say if there's a political figure, which these days most people do have one, which you think is totally abhorrent. Well, see if you can Think of the things which aren't, you know, that uh, appalling about that person, just as a mental exercise. I mean, when I hate President X or ex-President X, you know, it, it's not the case that um, I'm right and I'm seeing things clearly. And me hating that person 
does not hurt that person and doesn't really help the case in the world. You know, you want to be able to be smart about things and be able to look at things uh, from more angles. So becoming smart with the way that you, you look, the different angles that you can take on things. Uh, similarly, with the ears and sounds, what are, you, what are you listening to? This is like training a bird and birds are more trainable, I believe, than, than jackals probably. Um, but yeah, how do, you, how do you listen to? What am, I, what am I listening to? And similarly, if you find yourself really hating what's coming in from the outside, loud noise, like I was on a, my, my mom and I do Zoom, no, it's a FaceTime meditation every morning. So we FaceTime each other for 10 minutes and then she'll put on Headspace app or yeah, Headspace guided meditation because I'm her son and you know she made me so she doesn't want to hear my guided meditations. But um, uh, we put on Headspace and then we just listen for 10 minutes. But yesterday there was like a, a, a uh, woodpecker or something banging on the side of the, uh, the hut. And uh, I was like, this is really annoying. Um, but what, what can I shift my attention to? And really this, we've talked about it before, but this uh, nada sound or the, the sound of silence, this, you can tune into this kind of high pitched uh, sound of, of silence um, at any time, even if there's other things going on. And that's much more peaceful. It's less associated with uh, greed, anger, and delusion. So I could just shift my awareness to that. Okay, that's a lot more pleasant than the woodpecker or squirrel or whatever it is. So it's also good to train our dogs and our snakes and our apes and our crocodiles for sure. And really the mind is really what we need to, to train the most because the mind is the forerunner. The mind is the chief. The mind comes first. That's the first Dhammapada verse. If with a corrupted or a, uh, a dark mind, we look, act, or speak, or think, then suffering follows like the foot of an ox, the, uh, I'm sorry, like the wheel of a cart, the ox that comes before it. But if the mind is well-trained, then from that well-trained mind, which is the precursor, the chief, then if we look or speak or act or think from that wholesome, from a wholesome and bright mind, then happiness and sukha follows like a shadow that never leaves, like a shadow that never leaves. Uh, so that's quite beautiful. And that's what we can uh, train, train our hearts and train our, our minds to, to do. So that's why we're all here. And uh, it's great that we can all come together and maybe close the talk there and hope everybody can find their own skillful means for training these different animals, all these different senses that we need to train. So thank you. Okay, so we'll open things up for questions. And this week we've got, uh, last week we had that hot chair in the middle where making everybody come up and uh, sit in the hot seat. Um, but this week we've got some roving mics. Um, would somebody volunteer to be the mic person? Yeah, great. Thanks, Sai. So if anybody has questions here, and we'll also have probably questions from Zoom or YouTube. This isn't um, necessarily, it's not a question, it's a statement or a comment. Um, last Sunday, July 3rd, it was the one year anniversary of Lincoln Park's first Saturday gathering. So I just want to bring that up and we're all here. And I think there was three people that showed up. We had four. Four, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Four. <laughs> but um. I just, yeah, I thought about that driving home last Sunday 
that oh, I was like, this is July 3rd, July 3rd, a year ago, Lincoln Park. Um, yeah, so it was just a comment and um, I'm really happy to be back here. So thank you, Sadhu. I don't know if I was supposed to say that. Sadhu, Allison. Yeah, just to add that reflection. I mean, um, yeah, for those who have just been part of this for a few weeks or a few days or a few minutes, um, it's pretty clear that um, the people who've gathered around this aspiration of a Dharmic refuge in the nor Northwest that's really um, freely available to all where we can have a, a home for the Dhamma here and for monastics um, and monks is, uh, it's just been beautiful to see and the sincerity of those who've gathered, it's, it's astounding. Um, and yeah, that was a year ago. And I think we had one meeting at uh, Magnuson Park the month before that. And uh, two of those, two of the people, young men who were there at that time are now at monasteries. And yeah, we have quite a few who've gone off to look deeper into this life. So it's a good reflection, thank you. So speaking of people that have been here for a couple of minutes, hi everyone, I'm new here. My name is Frank. I've been active on the Discord for the last couple of days. And before that, I was on Mugaseka, which I'm still connected with. Anyway, it's good to finally be here. I've been sort of practicing by myself since I was in high school and I'm 30 now, so it's really nice to be connected up with an actual community. It's really changed and deepened my sense of what the Dhamma and this whole pursuit is to actually be able to interact with monks and people that are trying to do the same thing I am. Anyway, <laughs> a bad habit of rambling, but so. I've been fortunate in a sense that I was born with a fun collection of neurological and physical differences that means I'm on lifetime disability and am living at home with my parents. This has meant that I have a whole ton of time to myself as long as I take care of things around the house and help out when I asked. And I've begun to uh, devote more and more of that to Dhamma practice, whether that's meditation or a Sutta study and et cetera. And my mom has brought up a couple of times that, you know, it's great you're seeing benefit from this, but could you maybe spend some time reading something else besides Buddhism stuff? And I've, run into this issue that I've slowly sort of lost interest in a lot of popular entertainment over the years and find that I just do better, that my issues are less of an issue, that sort of the Buddha was basically right when he <laughs> said that this really does change things. And so I'm sort of, I guess, looking for maybe some advice as to how to deal with this whole situation while being still grateful to my parents for being there and supportive of me. Yeah, Frank, it's good to meet you. Um, yeah, it's a good question. I think, uh, that happens with a lot of people, kind of interest comes in Dhamma and then all sorts of other interests kind of pass to the, pass along the wayside and that might change. I like for myself, I really, it was more, for me, it was more of an active choice. The first year I was living in the monastery, I only read Pali Canon basically and didn't read anything else, uh, but then have definitely opened up over the years. And similarly for that year, my mom was like, okay, he's in a cult, you know, kind of, uh, 
quite worried because uh, that's what, yeah, I mean, that's what parents would think. You know, you're only reading one type of thing and they might have the idea that you're you know, intentionally putting blinders on yourself. And uh, a good thing to look out for is this inner sense of uh, dispassion or, or just really like, okay, had enough. And it's not out of aversion. Like for me, some of it was aversion. Like, okay, I'm, just, I'm, I'm a real monk, you know, I'm going to be a real monk. And um, yeah, real monks don't eat, read anything other than polycan and something like that. Um, and that's kind of aversive and view-based. Whereas if it's really just like, okay, just, I don't, I don't need it. I don't really want to read that much. Simplifying can be a, a great thing. There's a, a Thai word, which can be, everybody should learn this is bleh, bleh, <laughs> which just means like bored. You're just totally bored with, with these things. And that, that can be a good thing. Bleh and I, like you, you lose interest in these other things and it can be a good thing, but it's also a good thing to have good relationship with your family members. So I think even during that year, I think I did lead, let myself read like these like Bible quotes. It was like one quote a day that my grandma from this book that my grandma had. And uh, she was happy that I did that. And yeah, I can endure, you know, one Bible quote a day. So, um, so maybe it'll change. And if it doesn't, then maybe you can yeah, read something your mom wants you to read and maybe it, it won't hurt. So. Yeah, good to meet you, Frank. Thanks for joining us. Um, I think what Ajahn Kovila said is, is right on. Um, and I would only add that uh, often when people start to practice, they have a bit of guilt actually around um, not just losing interest um, in things they formerly were kind of enchanted with, uh, but also, um, yeah, really just pulling in a little bit. Um, you know, becoming interested in their own practice and maybe they pull back from issues that they used to really care deeply about and were identified strongly with. And this can be awkward, you know, if, um, because a lot of the world and social conversation uh, pitches, pitches itself on outrage, self-righteousness, othering, political vehemence. Um, and if you're not quite willing to dive straight into that, people do notice gossip, for example, you know, if you're not willing to kind of meet someone who that your relationship was founded on that uh, at work or elsewhere, it can be difficult. Um, and so I'd say first, uh, with situations where you're pulling back from something which seems like a really, seemed like a really important cause, and maybe still is such, maybe you were politically active, and suddenly you find yourself just inclined to go home and sit for a while instead. And there can be a real conflict in people around that. Like, is this wrong? Am I being selfish? And I'd say it's useful to reflect that at the beginning, it's as if we're peeling off this scab that we've had on our, our hearts, our minds for um, years. And we kind of have this raw wound at the beginning of practice. And it's okay to give yourself permission. You know, you've been in this game for decades, for lifetimes. Uh, give yourself a year, a few years, just be okay pulling in, it's okay. And what you'll move back into the world with is of a value which is inestimable, inestimable. How do you say that? It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I would, tr if you're really feeling wholesomely inclined towards pulling in, um, I'd say it's, it's okay to trust that and know that when the practice becomes stronger, people do move out in the world again, but they move out into it with a degree of love, caring, and blessing that they have they did not have before. And that's what the world needs more than anything. Um, and then last Saturday, um, I spoke about this tension between um, dham, Dhamma Pati Sambhita, which is the ability to connect things back to the Dhamma and Niruti Pati Sambhita, which it's the ability to kind of play with language. And I'd just say, like Ajahn Kovilo is reflecting, holding that tension with your family, like you might be diving deeper into Dhamma, but be willing to kind of learn to speak their language a little bit, bring them along a little, like read the Bible quote, um, find a book that bridges the two paths. I know um, one young practitioner with a father who is deeply Christian, and there's a book called The Way of the Pilgrim about this 18th century pilgrim in Russia who 
wanders for his whole life with a backpack full of bread, um, repeating the Jesus prayer. And he's very deep samadhi. And this became the bridge between this young man and his father, where they could talk about meditation across traditions. So find a way to bridge the gap if you can, you know. Thank you. Um, I was really interested in what you're talking about uh, with not just the the sight in and of itself, but also the feeling of it in the eye and the muscle. Um, and I have mostly a background in Zen meditation where I was have open eye meditation. Um, so I'm kind of um, more at odds about what one to do, but I liked how you kind of gave the the option of the, you do both, but um, I wanted to see if you could talk more about like the, about that because I'm kind of stuck in the Zen mode, but I'd like to be more, um, I guess, do both as well. And just maybe if you could talk about the benefit of both of those or if there's a better thing to do in your opinion. Well, it's good to meet you. Um, yeah, yeah, Zen usually does have the f at least the branches that I've heard about, yeah, are kind of eyes lowered, but open. And in Theravada circles, usually eyes are closed, um, but it really does depend. I mean, um, I can't remember if when the Buddha is talking about uh, meditation, if he asks, tells people to close their eyes, I don't, I don't think it's ex explicitly listed. In, and it's really just a, a skillful means. Um, so doing whichever one uh, is most helpful for giving rise to wholesome mental states or kind of uh, getting over or getting around uh, overcoming uh, unwholesome mental states. So specifically, if you're, if you're drowsy, then opening your eyes is great. Um, and if you're uh, just, you know, the eyes are just wanting to look at stuff and you're just looking all over the place and you can actually feel the heat in the, in the eyes themselves. Uh, if your eyes are open, then that might be a suggestion you could you can experiment with with closing your eyes and yeah it really depends i mean i do both types of meditation most days during even within one sit you know i don't uh and yeah don't restrict myself to one one mode or the other um but if i could do that i find that zen way of doing it like the eyes down but open i find that really difficult so i kind of wish i could do it but um yeah, so I think just you can experiment and and see what what helps. You might find that having your eyes closed actually does bring you bring you inwards in a sense. It kind of cuts off the most one of the most exciting sense doors. So, you have thoughts? On that? No, my parents and I once stopped at the San Francisco Zen Center, and they they do the eyes open meditation just facing the wall. But we're Theravadan, so we all were facing the wrong direction when everyone's sitting. So, yeah. <laughs> Any live stream questions? Hello, Venerable. You can type your question in the chat or raise your hand and they'll choose you. Um, we're going to experiment, see if, uh, I guess that's, is that Amy? Mary, excuse me. Mary, if you've got a question, you can uh, try speaking it. If that doesn't work, you can type it into the chat. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? You can unmute yourself. I am unmuted. No, no chance to hear me. me. No. Okay. Yeah, okay. if you could type your question. Um, thank you, Mary. Any other questions? Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to what may be a pitfall of forming rigid moral judgments sort of in the name of the practice and of the teaching. Um, 
like I was thinking in regards to lustful uh, thoughts and, you know, looking at someone with lust and sort of one approach being, you know, this is natural and I can just be with these thoughts and feelings. Um, but the approach of sort of countering it with, you know, a different mode of perception or a different way of thinking seems like it could easily transform into sort of a moral judgment about it as if it's something bad. I wonder if you could speak to that. Yeah, it's a good question. And it's something which uh, you really hear highlighted quite a lot like when you go, if you ordain in Thailand, um, one of the main things for young monks to pay attention to are some of the fetters, you know, where we are as practitioners looking at greed, anger, you know, greed, lust, whatever. Um, but also at pride and views, like attachment to pride and attachment to views, this ditti mana. And it's something which, uh, yeah, really, you find it. There's the Buddha said once said that uh, uh, lay people or non monastics will oftentimes quarrel over sensual things, you know, like, you've got more of this than I do. And you've got more of these great things than, than I do these beautiful things. Whereas monastics, we quarrel over over views, like we've got some like attachment to this is true, and everything else is false. And yeah, I think in terms of actual practice with the eyes or practice with any of these things, just look at, at how it's affecting you and how you're, you're holding it up. I mean, even the word, um, you know, even a monk saying like, you know, examine lust, you know, that might, one might hear that as just being inherently oppressive or um, yeah, uh, just inhibiting yourself. Um, so yeah, experiment and see what, what works for you and the people around you. Like um, if you notice, or not, not you, but if someone, if someone's being all creepy when they're staring and lustfully, lustfully at somebody, it might be worthwhile to experiment not doing that. But if you're not being creepy um, and it's not hurting you or you don't see the, the pain, then uh, yeah, experiment with other ways to, uh, to relate to that. Um, Yeah, the, uh, the Buddha, it's a really good question. Um, the Buddha spoke about uh, one of the categorical teachings in Buddhism, which is applicable at all times is the Four Noble Truths. And, um, you know, virtue or morality in a Buddhist sense, I mean, it's kind of a, a difficult term in the West because of our Puritan roots um, and just our self-recriminating tendencies. Um, so I'd say, you, you know, really Ajahn Lee said that um, samadhi concentration was, or virtue was the, the metaphor for the concentrated mind. And all these rules, um, you know, these restraints, these boundaries we put up for ourselves, um, they're all for the sake of allowing the mind to calm and brighten and therefore be able to see clearly. It's um, the Buddha didn't say you had to do these things. He said, if you want a calm mind, these are helpful techniques. And so on one level, you're just seeing the Four Noble Truths um, in terms of what lack of sense restraint does feel like. Like, you know, maybe it does feel good to jump into the horror movie or whatever, but then, you know, you come out of it and there's the hangover, there's the letdown and um, really seeing the suffering, the dukkha, that's in those things kind of hidden in the aftermath that we so often miss because we're jumping to the next thing. And meditation really helps with this because you get to see the echo clearly and you get to see that the mind can't calm down. You know, uh, for example, we aren't really supposed to listen to music much and I had to go listen to a sermon. Um, I love, it was a really great sermon but they played somewhere over the rainbow on the ukulele beforehand. And for two weeks, that was my meditation. Um, so, but that application of the Four Noble Truths, you continue with it because then you realize that when 
you know, that aversive tendency towards yourself or that crystallizing into a view or self-judgment or this whole structure of what we call a sankara, a program of self-recrimination, of judgment towards yourselves and others. Um, you see the suffering in that too. And you see the weight and the unnecessaryness of it. And you feel the suffering of that and the coarseness of it. Um, and that's more subtle. And um, there's no real fast route to that except for, you know, uh, watching it come up in meditation and seeing the echo of that and then just slowly letting it go. The second noble truth is to relate, release craving, um, to release the cause of that suffering. So I just think it's very common for people when they undertake the training to, you know, you're taking on this sort of suit of clothes of views and it's a lot. And just have faith that over time, if you're gentle, um, you'll begin to put down the excess of that and hold it more lightly and, and caringly. And then I'd say just really bringing in loving kindness practice because it'll pervade out through through the whole of the practice as well. It's a really good question. As to Allison's comment, I thought the one year anniversary, my primary source of object I provide is the mind. The contemplation of the spread of the Dhamma is from my thoughts. Thumbs up. Do you agree? <laughs> <laughs> the practice decreasing other interests? Yes. And as the time goes on, a whole new world opens up to practitioners. There are Sangha members everywhere who welcome other practitioners. I would just say, um, I really appreciate that comment. And Ajahn Amaro reflects that uh, monks are the true hedonists. And I think this goes for all practitioners. It's like people think you're giving things up, but what they don't realize is what you're stepping into is a, um, a, a real brightness. Like as a, you know, as a monk, we give up movies, um, you know, the theme parks, you know, various things. Uh, I don't, I couldn't think of anything else. We do give that up though. Killing, we give killings, Ajahn. Um, but what we get to spend, those things never mattered to me anyways. And um, what always really, I did care about was like the, I did like theme parks, yeah, <laughs> back in the day. Um, but what I cared about was real conversation and connection. And you don't lose that, you gain more and more. So this, you know, this path is one of brightness. Um, you might be less interested in, you know, the ski vacation or something, but uh, yeah, it's um, the path of renunciation. It, when the hand lets go of kind of what it's been clinging to it, it feels with something, you know, a lot of sunlight, there's something left. Um, okay, Gary, we have one more. We may have to wrap up in a second, please. A moment ago in talking about letting go of judgment, um, you referred to the Four Noble Truths. And for those of us who, who haven't been studying them for long, they're kind of a shorthand. I'm wondering if you would just list the four, maybe or maybe not make comments, whatever you like. So um, the Four Noble Truths um, are problematically often uh, phrased as kind of statements of fact, like life is suffering. Um, the statement is there is dukkha. Um, and it's more useful to look at them in terms of the tasks the Buddha said we should undertake with each. So the first noble truth um, is, uh, or the task involved with it is we need to comprehend suffering or see the stress. Um, the second noble truth is letting go of its cause, which is craving attachment. Um, the third noble truth is to realize peace, cessation of that suffering. And then the fourth is to develop the path towards that cessation. So in a practical instance, um, with that sort of self-recrimination or judgment, um, you notice the sort of burning sensation of it. There's no There's no drug like self-righteousness. It's really powerful. <laughs> and notice the burning of it. Notice kind of 
it, it hurts at the same time. Buddha, the Buddha compared, um, what was it? Anger with its honeyed tip and poisoned root. So like notice the burning of it, notice how it makes you act. And um, you notice how you're kind of feeding it and feeding off of it, how you're becoming drunk on it. And you just restrain that. And that's kind of letting go of the craving, um, the second noble truth. And then you notice a peace, a subtle brightness below that comes when it fades and that's realizing peace. And then you develop that more and more and more and that's developing the path, the fourth, so.